people have been asking about my process and what I use to work with, so I'll do a video and share what little knowledge I have gathered over the last uh, 15 years or so, and um, hopefully some of you will find it useful. If you're setting out to make a game, you're going to need a few important things. You're going to need space, you're going to need time, um, you're going to need a half-decent computer, um, and you're going to need some software. Um, space, you really need to be able to work relatively uninterrupted. So you either need to carve out a couple of hours of productive time to do work, or somewhere away from everybody else. Um, other people, some people find stimulus important. I, I find stimulus from social media like Twitter important. It helps keep my brain going, help keep, helps keep me thinking even while I'm working. Other people find that too much of a distraction. Some people like to have other people around talking to them. Some people don't. Find a space that works for you, something that helps, helps you work and, and sort that out. Time-wise, again, like carving out space, that can be difficult, but you know, um, you really need blocks of at least an hour in which you can work hour to two hours, and then and then take a take a break, do something else, come back. Um, that's kind of the the at least what I find, or what most studies and things seem to find is is the optimal way to work. Two hours, fifteen minutes. Two hours, fifteen minutes, and so on. Um, I have issues because of my uh, depression and other other things in my life that make it difficult for me to work for protracted periods. So. If you've got the flexibility to work when you feel up to it and when you feel like it, that's that's a huge help. Software-wise, I use Photoshop, InDesign for the desktop publishing, and I used to use Word. Now I'm using Open Office. There used to be some compatibility issues with importing uh, Word documents that were created in Open Office or LibreOffice or any of the other derivatives into InDesign, but those don't seem to be an issue anymore. So you should be cool with that. Now obviously InDesign and Photoshop are hugely expensive, but they are worth shelling out for. Um, and unlike Photoshop, InDesign's incarnation seem to be much more consistent. So once you've learned InDesign, you don't have to tell, seem to you don't seem to have to relearn it with every iteration in the same way that you do with Photoshop. Photoshop can change a lot <laughs> between editions, uh, and that can be rather rather confusing. Um, obviously, Photoshop's more important if you are uh, the person making the art. If you're not the person making the art, and you can make sure that the artists get everything exactly to spec, exactly how you need, then you don't really need that you can just import into InDesign and you won't need it but it's always useful to have that backup for any little edits or cuts or clips or adjustments that you might need to make and you may need to make some adjustments for print and so on so in my opinion it's worth having GIMP I'm told is as good uh, but I find the interface unintuitive so personally I would be less inclined to use GIMP for professional work, but that's just me. You may find it useful and easy, and if you've been using it for a long time, it's a, it's obviously going to be more familiar to you. And if you don't have any money, GIMP's a great alternative, so you could use that. If you're going to be making a game, you need a good idea, um, and good ideas. It's not something you can necessarily put your finger on right away, so. Probably the best way to gauge what's a good idea is whether you are enthusiastic about it, um, combined with whether you think it has a, a reasonable larger appeal. Because um, there are things you might be fanatical about that don't necessarily click with other people. Um, for example, I met a, a new young designer at a convention who had a, a game based around their absolute obsession um, with a certain kind of animal. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I don't want to embarrass them in case they're watching or whatever. Um, but yeah, their enthusiasm was palpable and it, it came off the page and it came off them and it was a... 
obviously something that meant a huge amount to them um, and obviously they were enthused about the idea but it was so impenetrable and so based around that obsession that it was hard for anyone else to really grasp what he was on about or um, or to have this, that same level of engagement so you need to strike a balance between the two it should be something that you are invested in and enthusiastic about but it should also be something that will at least somewhat <laughs> appeal to other people something accessible I, th I think that's the important thing and I think that's part of the reason so many RPGs are kind of I don't want to say derivative, but uh, broad. Um, they are either set in a, a lore and a background that people already know and understand and love, or they are kind of generic. Now, the examples of these would be, say, the various incarnations of Lord of the Rings RPGs. So many people have read the books, seen the films, and so on, that there's an easy in for people in, into that lore. So there's an in into the game. On the other hand, you have something like D&D, &D, which is more of a toolkit with which people can create their own worlds, but it has standard fantasy tropes, elves, dwarves, magic, etc., that everybody understands and, and buys into. Which isn't to say that... Uh, there's no definitive advice here, I'm just kind of giving my perspective. Which isn't to say that games with peculiar backgrounds can't be really interesting and can't create cult audiences of their own, like um, say Empire of the Petal Throne it has a weird world that people are heavily into, or some more obscure games like Tales of Gargantir had had really interesting worlds, um, and there's other there's other options options like that. And though I've said you know broad games and familiar lore is is a good way to find something that people can hook into, there's also a lot of indie games that are really tightly focused on like even one particular encounter and the whole game is built around that one thing and you replay it in different iterations so there, there are no hard and fast rules here I'm, I'm just offering a kind of general perspective that if you are going for what you think is a good idea it should be something that you love and are interested in and if you want to do something more commercial something that's going to appeal to other people then you need to consider whether it's an accessible idea or not so once you've got an idea, what I normally do with it is I write it on a post-it note or stick it in a text document somewhere and forget about it for six months and then come back when I've got an open slot and uh, look through all these crazy ideas I've, I've written down and try to work out what the hell I was thinking and whether any of them are actually usable or not. Um, and then I pick one that I feel enthusiastic about or that I've been promising for a long time and feel I ought to put out um, and then I start working on it. There's plenty of people who will tell you that system doesn't matter, that you can have a perfectly good game of any kind with any system. To an extent they're right but it depends on the group and I am of the school that system matters. That system can reinforce or degrade from the kind of feel that you're aiming for uh, with your game. For example, uh, if you want a high action game, then look at games like Feng Shui, where the system is light and simple and emphasizes action and encourages stunts and so on. And you can see how the system supports the kind of game that you're going for. Um, if you're looking for something harsh and unforgiving, you could look to Lamentations of the Flame Princess, which while derived from old school D&D um, rules, it takes the kind of extreme point of view on, on those kind of the old school games where you could die at any minute and you know, getting a character past level 3 was considered a, a real accomplishment. Um, for games, investigative games, games that are more grounded in, in reality, then you might want systems that are more graspable um, in, in mathematical terms. So something like uh, basic role-playing, which is used for Call of Cthulhu and uses a 1 to 100 system. You know, percentages are something everyone can grasp and somehow it lends a more... I don't want to say realistic, but um, a more plausible sense sense to a game 
uh, probabilities that people can, can grasp. If you want something that's more story and narrative led, then maybe you want to go for something simpler like dice pools or fate or so on. Now, there's plenty of systems that are open, um, not just the, the big obvious ones like fate or d20 or whatever license the new D&D is going gonna, is gonna to be put under if it ever is. You know, there's plenty of options out there. I've used the D6 system recently um, for games that I've been thinking will need to be kind of gateway systems to people. Um, because back in the day, the West End Games version of Star Wars used the D6 system, and it seemed to be an accessible, easy system for people getting into role playing for the first time. Um, and and yet at the same time, it's quite adaptable and it has some potential depth to it. So. It, I think it's a good game to e ease people into something more more complex. Um, you may need to make up your own system. Now, if you're a small startup studio with no resources to put into playtesting and, and so on, this might not be a good idea um, because systems are tricky and when you are playing amongst your friends and so on you, you don't necessarily realize that you're house ruling on the fly or that people are being quite forgiving with you um, and, and following the letter of the rules and not necessarily trying to exploit them and so on and getting play testers is surprisingly hard you will get lots of people who will say that they are happy to play test games for you but getting the reports back from them and getting them to do it properly is a pain in the ass. Um, scheduling online play sessions for playtesting can work, but the online environment is very different to being sat around a table. If you're designing a game that's designed to be used in an online environment, then that's going to be really, really useful. But if you're designing a more conventional game meant to be played around the table with your friends, not so useful. And if you're designing board games or card games or things that incorporate physical elements, it's pretty much right out the window. Um, we need better internet support tools for playing games. Um, too many at the moment are kind of impenetrable, um, complex, you know, designed by, by coders for coders and not really <laughs> geared to the casual user, um, which, is, uh, which is a problem. And um, unfortunately the D&D tools from back in the day, 4th edition, 3rd edition, never materialised and those looked accessible and useful but they never turned out and too much of it is people trying to gouge you for money. So yeah, there's problems there but system, ideally system and setting should be harmonious to one another and each should feed into the other. The system should encourage the kind of role playing behaviour and style that you want to see and that's pretty much how you choose a system. Briefly, probably the most important thing you need to consider is whether you're going for a system that feels like it simulates real life or whether it simulates heroism. And dice mechanic is the, the, the basis of that. So reality has a, a bell curve where average results are the most common and then it tails off. So really bad and really good results are at the end, like so. Whereas heroic, the results tend to be much flatter. So really bad and really good things happen in heroic stories much more often than they do in real life. So if you're trying to simulate reality, you want to simulate that bell curve. Uh, and one simple way to do that is to have two additive dice. So one to six, one to six, you're gonna cluster around the middle results. Whereas if you roll a single dice, the probabilities are all even, and so you will tend to get as many low and high results as you will everything else. Whereas the combined dice, you'll get that curve. So probability <laughs> theory is something you need to consider whether it backs up. Now, it's worth mentioning briefly that fate is kind of an exception to this rule. The way fate dice work, they will cluster in that middle sort of reliable result and yet fate is often used for kind of pulpy high action games what twists that is that fate characters will tend to be fairly competent at least in the in the heroic games so 
they will tend to get that average result and if they're already competent they will get that competent result and the other thing is that fate points and stunts push that curve across so that you tend to get the higher results in things that you're really good at so again this is something that's not a hard and fast rule but it's something to bear in mind right at the early design stage writing a whole game can seem really really daunting because there's so much to do and it's hard to know where to start I have it down to a kind of a, a formal process so what I do is I open a new document and I break down what I need to write so title and then all the subheadings so credits legal information introduction um, all the other main headings so character creation combat skills background blah 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 blah, blah. Sub then I go back and I add all the subheadings I can think of so underneath the in introduction I might have who I am who the company is contact information a brief synopsis of the game a brief synopsis of what RPGs are a brief synopsis of um, what you do in this game okay and then going down to background you might have breakdowns of the individual races countries worlds um, technologies things like that so you're starting to construct kind of a, a skeleton of what the whole book will be like by putting in your main headings your subheadings your sub subheadings um, and while I'm doing that I make little notes in italics or brackets of things I want to make sure that I incorporate so that gives you a whole skeleton of your, of your whole of your whole document and then you can go back and start to fill that in you don't have to do it in order I tend to I tend to go through step by step by step section by section writing bit by bit and what this does is it breaks down this this daunting structure and I this the same way I do my fiction as well it breaks down this daunting structure into bite-sized chunks that you can approach and get a real sense of accomplishment when you finish a section or, or whatever which you can normally do in a day uh, at least you can usually at least do one section you know even if you can only snatch half an hour you can bang out a paragraph or two and th that may be enough you know that may be enough to describe a country or a, or a forest or a, or a character race or or something like that so that's how I do it work out your skeleton add all the subheadings make notes on things you definitely want to incorporate, brainstorm ideas, note those down there, and then go back and add, add meat onto the bones. Um, and that's, that's how I go about it anyway. Lots of people skimp on editing, and it's understandable why. Showing someone your manuscript is like sending your kid to school for the first day. You know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Um, it's it's difficult to let other people look over your work uh, but you know you're gonna release this to the public at some point and um, what's the difference well I guess the difference is you're inviting someone to critique it and go through it and cut it to shreds which is never ever fun but if you can afford it editing is definitely worthwhile but given the budgets and margins of independent role-playing publishing editing is often not something you'll choose to scrimp on but something you may need to scrimp on um, because you simply don't have the money or, or the margin to do it so if you can afford an editor get an editor if you can't afford to get an editor there are some cheap or free kind of alternatives but they're nowhere near as good as editing um, but here's what they are get friends and family to read through it and spot any mistakes um, they will not necessarily do it to a professional standard obviously um, and they will probably go easy on you but it will turn out any any glaring errors or mistakes spell check and grammar check in word and similar programs is somewhat helpful but if you're using it on your first draft it's not going to help you much at all really and often in writing gaming because you'll be writing stuff in character as well as formal formal writing formal prose um, it will often flag things that don't actually need changing uh, plus you'll be using all kinds of weird words that don't really exist 
so uh, that can get really annoying as well and all the little red lines and things can obfuscate real problems in the text so that's that one thing I have found incredibly useful um, for gauging the, the cadence and, and, the, and the feel of the writing is to use automated voice software. I used to use um, text-to-speech called Read Please, which was quite useful, but I haven't used that in a while, and I don't know what's current, um, but that's a good way of going over your text, to just um, put the raw text in, into the uh, text-to-speech software sit back, listen to it, pause it anywhere where the punctuation and so on seems to sound off. Now you need to use a good program for this because like the basic Windows text-to-speech and uh, some of the online ones aren't that good um, and they will get the cadence wrong anyway because it's a robot saying it so they won't necessarily follow the punctuation in a, in a way that makes sense or, or that another reader will so you do need to be careful but if you've got any recommendations for text-to-speech software that does a good job please uh, comment below and um, then I can recommend later on after your own time and effort art will generally be your biggest layout uh, in terms of finance um, for your game and bad art will kill you faster than bad writing will if you want to sell your game you at least need to have a good cover um, so you need to bite the bullet and you need to lay out stuff in, in money in advance to make sure you get good art now there's plenty of resources online uh, for game art, stock art and so on. Regular stock art sites will not tend to have the kind of stuff that you need. There are independent artists and collectives of artists who have decent stock art. Um, if you go to RPG Now, uh, Drive Through RPG, they're the same site, different front ends. Um, you will find plenty of stock art in the publisher resources section. Um, I sell a lot of stock art done by my friend Brad McDevitt. Um, and a couple of other artists do work for me. I'm always happy to sell stock art for other people because I already have an established front end. If you want to sell stock art through me, um, yeah, give me give me a shout, and um, I'll see if I can see if I can sort you out. I like doing it because it helps to promote artists um, and gives them a bit of a bit of a regular income, not like huge bucks, like maybe. 30 to 50 dollars a month if, you, if you're doing pretty well but um, it does it does help you out uh, and from my point of view it draws people to my pages and helps them see my other games and things so it helps me out so yeah if you want to sell through an established front end talk to me so um, shilling aside uh, you will find plenty of resources there um, other places to look for artists um, if you're not on a huge budget you can go to DeviantArt and look around, maybe you can find artists there. Some of them are more than happy and willing to, to work with people at the kind of prices we can afford. Um, others, not so much. Lots of them will not reply to you. Um, you just need to keep, keep plugging away. But what's really important in this industry is to establish a good working relationship and trust with an artist. Um, a lot of people in this industry, including the big companies, are slow to pay if they pay at all, um, are, can be really persnickety about changes and so on. You should try, if you want to establish a good relationship with an artist and if you want to get their best work, to be accommodating, to give them room to express themselves, to adjust to their work process. Now. In the tabletop RPG industry, we cannot generally afford to pay the kind of rates that the fantasy art is actually worth. Um, I don't think the kind of pay scale that in indie um, indie game design has been paying to artists has really gone up at all in the last ten years, at least, probably longer. Um, you should be aiming and expecting to pay about. $100 for black and white, A4, $50 for half page, 25 for quarter. You don't really want to go below quarter page because then you, it gets too tricky for everyone and it's, it's 
you're just not going to get good work. Um, for colour, you're going to be looking at, at double that. So that's 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 roughly the rates. I mean, good artists will rate more. Poor artists will rate less. You can negotiate over things like who retains the image rights uh, for prints and whether they can resell it later on or whether there's a there's a delay. Um, so, you know, th there's leeway there. And if you're ordering a large chunk of art, maybe you can negotiate a discount. But because we can't pay very much in independent RPGs, you really, really need to work hard at getting a good relationship. So you need to give them space and time, maybe loosen up your, your deadlines. You need to pay on time. This is really important. And, and don't pay on publication. Pay when the art is in. Okay, The sooner and quicker you pay artists, the more willing they are going to be to, to work for you. Um, and it's just the decent thing to do anyway. So I definitely recommend doing that. Once you've got an established relationship with an artist, it's also a good thing to be able to pay in advance. Um, and if you're working with an established artist, let them set the, set the terms as much as possible. Uh, because they've already got the reputation and they've already got the quality of the work. So, yeah, there's that. If you're trying to produce work on a budget, use the stock art, um, but try to avoid stuff that's been used, obviously, and too often, because it just kind of reeks, reeks of cheapness. Um, and students are good to work with because you're giving them money towards their tuition and their living expenses. You're giving them experience in a work environment um, and some kind of expectation of what, what kind of work they can get when they leave uh, and, and they're cheap. So art students are, are good people to work with. Um, I tend to find them to be quite enthusiastic and, and willing and I like the feeling of helping them out and yet at the same time you know, you're getting cheap work. So everyone's a winner, basically, if you're working with art students. But people who've left university and college also need work. So yeah, don't, be, don't be afraid to work with them. If you're an artist as well, do the work yourself. <laughs> um, I'm not particularly. Um, but occasionally I'll do a, do a sketch or an edit or, or something into a game. But you can usually tell because it's shit. Okay, so you've got your book. You've got your art. Now you need to lay it out. Now... Like I say, I use InDesign, other desktop publishing software is available. Um, you don't need to do anything particularly fancy. Um, in fact, often people go overboard and overclutter the page, add borders that eat inches into the text or, or muddy it. You don't need to do any of that. A bit of style, a bit of flash is, is, is good. Section headers are good, page numbers are good. Um, but other than that, everything else is, is optional. Um, but ideally, you want a layout that will reinforce the feel of the game, and you want a layout that is usable. But if these come in conflict ever, go for usable over, over artistic, because a game book is something that is intended to be used. It's a, it's a manual. It needs to be something that you can go through and, and see what's there. So when you're doing your layout, I would tend to prioritize usability. Short books, you know, under under 100 pages, you can probably get away with screwing around a bit more because they're they're less dense, there's less to get through, and it's easier to find things when there's only 100 pages to go through. So then it's less of a priority, but if you're talking like a, a 200 page plus book, then usability definitely needs to needs to be up there. If you fancy doing something more more posh, then great. If you don't, also great. If you can afford to hire a layout person, by all means, use their expertise. Um, it's it's usually worth it. But again, budgetary concerns usually mean that you can't afford to hire a layout person, which is unfortunate. But um, most desktop publishing, if you're just doing a basic layout, it's easy enough to understand, um, and you can turn out something that looks looks reasonably good. And uh, then you can get that into print format make sure you get this right and make sure your graphics from earlier in art are at least 300 dpi.
So at the end of all this process, you have a game. It looks good, it's ready to go, it's in PDF format for print and for online. I generally drop the online sales to around 150 dpi output. So that's suitable for home printing, but so that the print quality version is at least 300 to 600 dpi and looks that much better. So, what do you do with it? Well, main sales points that are available are RPG Now slash Drive Through, which are both uh, under the banner of One Bookshelf. That is the major site to sell PDFs. They also now support a certain amount of print-on-demand and can do print-on-demand card games, though I've not tried that. The print-on-demand used to be done through Lightning Source and the quality wasn't fantastic, um, but it, it's probably improved since then. I mean, this, this was years ago, so worth a shot. And um, if people are already looking at your product, they are perhaps more likely to buy the print version from a trusted site like that. Lulu.com is great for print on demand. Um, I'm given to understand that the quality in some countries isn't as good. Um, so in America, the print version done, done through them may not be up to snuff, but the European printers I've had no trouble with. Uh, it generally looks fantastic when I've had uh, print issues like um, pages mangled or torn or anything like that, which has only happened twice I think all blank pages bound into a book yeah I've only had twice had issues and they replaced it all um, straight away so um, I definitely recommend using Lulu for print on demand and their interface is easy to use and quite forgiving compared to other sites and they don't charge you for setting up titles which is another thing that people like Lightning Source do so Lulu is a little bit more expensive you get a little bit less of a cut but for a hassle free experience and good quality books, at least in Europe, I definitely recommend Lulu. Um, and they will sell electronic versions of your books, so you can you can set up through them to sell to the Apple Store and everything else, and they will give you an ISBN as well. It's just so much easier, and their tech support is quite friendly and helpful, albeit Indian, so there's sometimes some communication difficulties, but they will go out of their way to help you. So. I recommend Lulu. My experience with them has been great, while my experience with people like Lightning Source has not been so great, but that's probably partially down to me and my technical ineptitude. So, apart from those, uh, and you can sell PDFs through Lulu as well. Uh, aside from those, Amazon, tricky setup, sales, at least for me, haven't been fantastic through Amazon. You would think such a big store would be a good thing, but I think the searchability on independent and self-published stuff has taken a big hammering. So, uh, and it's more difficult to set up in Amazon if you're in Europe, um, or at least it has been up, and, up until now. Um, if anyone knows different, comment below please. Um, but if you're in America, at least monetarily, financially wise, it should be easier to set up and it's probably worth worth your while doing in the long run if you're planning on selling in the long term. Uh, Paizo's online store is okay, uh, one fourth to one fifth of the sales you get through drive through from my experience. Um, E23 is worth setting up on as well, again one quarter to one fifth of the sales you get through drive through. IPR used to be bigger and if you're an indie publisher, if you're doing like cool hippie-ish indie games, then IPR, Indie Press Revolution, is probably still worth selling through. So your book's done, it's out, it's selling, what next? Well, probably in the previous section about getting it out there, I should have talked about actual print sales into shops. Now, it's tempting to do a print run and to try and get your work out there but print runs have been dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and the smaller the print run the more expensive it is so it's often hard to gauge where it's worth doing a big print run and by big I only mean something like 2000 books um, or whether it's worth sticking with print on demand and it's really hard to tell um, where that point is if you're not doing a big release with an established property and everything else is probably not worth it. A lot of shops aren't taking 
much in the way of RPGs anymore. The board game boost has dragged a lot of money away from that. RPGs are often relegated to the back, and they will probably only have the few major RPGs in. So they might have the one or forty thousand RPGs. They might have D and D. They might have Fate, um, and they're not going to have a lot else on show. Um, though I was surprised in in the states by how much Pathfinder stuff was in the was in the gaming stores, even though the rest of the RPG stuff was 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 pretty low. So, in my opinion, the RPG market is definitely shifting even further into print-on-demand, direct sales, and uh, electronic books. So, unless you want a garage full of 2,000 books mouldering away for months, it's probably not worth doing a proper print run. So, you basically, even if your, your game and your idea is shit, and terrible and nobody's interested you're probably pretty much guaranteed to sell about 50 copies in reasonably short order so when you're budgeting it's probably a good idea to gauge it around the 50 50 copies mark and through most of these sales sites you're going to be taking home 50 to 70 percent of the cover cover price, while the intermediaries are going to be taking the rest. So when you're gauging your budget, if you want to be really cautious and you want to see a return in a reasonably short amount of time, gauge that you're going to sell 50 copies in a reasonable amount of time, minimum, work out your cover price, half that, that's basically your safe operating budget for any project. If you've got more confidence in the project, put it up. If you've got less confidence in the project, move it down. But even after that, I mean, games, online sales, print on demand, PDFs, ebooks, go on for a long time. So you're going to continue to get sales. And when you put out another project, sales of your other, other previous projects will also bump up as well. So you're going to slowly, slowly, with each release, increase the amount of overall income that you're getting, provided you keep putting stuff out. And the thing about gamers and games is if you don't have releases, they will often assume that a game line is dead. So you either need to support your game or you need to make it clear that this is a one-off release. Um, so yeah, once all that's done, once things are on sale, you look to your next project and you go back to step one. Anyway, good luck, uh, or not good luck. Uh, hopefully this has put you off and you will not become my competition. Peace out.